it's a, it's a humbling thing when God calls you to preach his word and you realize how utterly unworthy you are to do so. But it's, uh, I'm thankful that we have a God who promises never to leave us nor forsake us. Amen. <clears throat> and now that we've had the reading of God's word, I'd like to also offer up a prayer to, for God to bless our time together. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship and sing praises unto you. Lord, thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I pray right now that you guard me from error, that you get me out of the way that your word may go forth and accomplish what it is to it, that it needs to accomplish. Lord, we praise you that we are able to gather in this place and that we have a love for you. And Lord, we are so unworthy, but we praise you in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, we, uh, the text that was just read, uh, it's the end of Matthew chapter 7, uh, famously called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has just spent roughly about three chapters teaching his disciples and telling them about all kinds of things, how to pray, what righteousness is, false prophets, and he comes to this last part of chapter 7 here, and he's uh, teaching about foundations, as Bradley was talking about. Now, anybody who's been in a, a house or a building knows that foundations are very important. Anybody who's ever bought a home knows that you get somebody to check the foundations. You, you have them check for cracks and for holes, anything that might break down and cause the structure that's built on top to collapse. So we know that foundations are important and strong foundations mean that the house that's built on top of it will keep standing. Now foundations don't just have to do with buildings and houses. They also have to do with our worldview, how we perceive reality. Everybody who walks on this earth has an understanding of truth and morality and love and philosophy and science and medicine. We have to try to make sense of what goes on around us. Now Jesus likens those who build their foundation upon the rock as wise people. Those who build their foundation on sand as foolish people. Jesus is making a very interesting comparison here. So as Christians, we have a foundation. We have things that are paramount to how we understand the world, how we can make sense of everything that goes on around us. As Christians, part of our foundation is that God exists and that he has revealed himself. Also that the Bible is God's holy and inspired word. And finally, that Jesus is Lord. These are our foundations. These are things that we have to have as Christians in order to make life make sense. Those who do not know Jesus have no firm foundation. Everything is shifting. Everything changes. Whichever way the wind blows, things change. But as Christians, our foundation is firm. Why? Because God says. Our foundation helps us to build our worldview, how to understand what's true, how to understand what morality is and love, understand about law, the confines of marriage, how we are to live, what life means, what science is, what philosophy is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's not a realm in reality which God has not spoken. Do we believe that? So the first premise that I brought up was that God exists. And I'm going to get a little more specific here. It's not just that God exists. It's that God that is revealed in the Bible exists. It's not the God of Islam or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or Buddhism or any other religion under the sun. It's the God of the Bible that exists. The Bible begins asserting that God exists. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created it doesn't leave it up to chance. Maybe God exists. Hopefully God exists. No, God exists. 
And we have to stand firm on that foundation. That has to be something that is bedrock for us as Christians. God has revealed himself. God has revealed himself in nature. We look at Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. We can see God's fingerprints on all of creation. In the sky that we look at, the tree out there, how the rain descends and circles back, we see God's handiwork. We see that there is a holy creator, the designer of the universe, the complexity of our circulatory system. All show the fingerprints of our creator, God. God also speaks on morality. The Old Testament is full of God's law, which tells us how to live. Why? Because God says. Now, do we believe that God has spoken? We do. So when someone asks us, why can you say that this is wrong and this is right? Because God says. I'm not relying on what I think. I'm not relying on what society says around me. I'm relying on the perfect and holy creator who set out everything in motion, who spoke creation into existence and then revealed himself to mankind. That's what I can stand on. That's a foundation that is firm. That is a foundation that cannot crumble. That is a foundation that does not change. It does not shift. It is constant. It is sturdy. We also know that God has spoken because all of us as individuals have a conscience. We know that there's right and wrong. Believer, unbeliever, we know that there is right and wrong. Again, God has spoken. We are created in the image of God. Again, God has spoken. Second premise, the Bible is God's holy and inspired word. I have a couple scriptures here that testify to this fact. Second Timothy 3.16, one I'm sure we're all familiar with, but we're just going to read it anyway. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Second scripture that testifies to that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 2 Peter 1.21 And the word of God reads, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible does not claim that it is authored by man on his own. Scripture testifies that God breathed. Scripture is God breathed. It's not implied, it's not suggested, but it's God breathed. God used man and he breathed into them to write his holy word. That's the God that we serve. So if the Bible comes from God, it has authority. Now, I'm not here this evening to defend the Bible. I, uh, I like a quote that, I believe it's attributed to Spurgeon, but I think he got it from somebody else. When asked about defending the Bible, he said, defend the Bible, I would defend the Bible like I would defend a lion. No, I would let the lion loose because the lion can defend itself. <laughs> God's word does not need me standing up here defending it. Although I believe there's amazing evidence that shows that God's word has been preserved from its writing until our day to day. But I don't have to do that because God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. 
because God's word is from the creator. I don't have to rely on myself. I don't have to rely on what I can remember. I don't have to rely on remembering this evidence and this evidence and this evidence. No, I stand on the foundation that God's word is true because God said it. We can also attest that Jesus believed that scripture was from God. John chapter 17, verse 7, Jesus says, Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And one more section here that really stands out to me is Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole section here, but I'm going to give a little bit of the context, and I'm going to just read the part that really stands out, that really drives the point home. Jesus has been teaching. He's departed from Galilee. He comes to Judea beyond Jordan, and there were multitudes following him, and he's been healing people. And the Pharisees, who were kind of the, the big wigs of the day as far as it came to God's law, they come to him and they tempt him and they say unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus answers and said, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder. Jesus makes a very profound statement in verse 4. Have ye not read, referring back to Genesis, referring to what God said in the Old Testament, Jesus believed that God had spoken. So if Jesus believes it, then one would have to bring a charge against Jesus Christ of Nazareth to say that he was wrong, or that he was a liar, or that he was mistaken. Jesus has been spoken about in literature. Even Islam says that Jesus is a prophet from God that lived a sinless life. Gandhi said that Jesus was an upright man. So no one can bring a charge against Jesus Christ. And if no one can bring a charge against Jesus Christ, then we have no reason not to take him at his word. But what's interesting here is that God has also spoken in other realms of life. God created in the beginning. God made them male and female. Man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And what God had brought together, let man not put asunder. God has spoken in the realm of marriage, in the realm of gender. God has spoken. So when we are asked, why is this not okay? We stand on the firm foundation because God said. So if you have an issue with what I'm saying, you're not attacking me. You're attacking God. You're attacking the creator of the universe. You have to take it up with him and he can defend himself. But Jesus affirms that God has spoken. Third premise, Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that Jesus is Lord? When we look at the time period that the New Testament was written in. It's written in the first century, and you have Jesus that is God incarnate. He has come down. He has walked among his creation. He has gone to the cross. He has been crucified. He has died. He has raised again on the third day. He has walked with his disciples for 40 days, teaching them, and then he ascended to God. You have the founding of the church. You have Pentecost. You have Paul on the Damascus Road. You have all these things in the first century. And as we read in the New Testament, Rome was in charge. And Rome, you could worship anybody you wanted. It didn't matter. 
You could worship Jesus. You could worship the God of wine. It didn't matter. But all you had to do was say that Caesar is Lord. You had to offer the pinch of incense to Caesar. Those first century Christians knew better. Because Scripture reveals that there is only one Lord. That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is King. That Jesus is the one that the knee is bowed to, not Caesar. How do we apply that today? When we are asked to do things that go against what God's Word says, are we firm enough in our convictions and our foundation to say, no, I serve a higher authority because God says, because God told me that that is not right. And it's not my opinion of what God says, it's written in His Word. Hebrews 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, talks about God speaking through the prophets and in these latter days speaking through his Son. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God has spoken through Jesus? Do we believe that Jesus is Lord? Again, John 14, 6, the, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, in this verse here, is claiming to be the embodiment of truth. So a proper understanding of truth has to have Jesus in the equation because God has spoken. So when Jesus says that he is the only way to the Father and Scripture confirms it, that's the foundation that we stand on because God says. Colossians 2, 3 says that in Christ Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that those who do not know Jesus Christ cannot have an understanding of what goes on around. That they may not uh, do things that line up with God's word even if by accident. They can do that because they're created in God's image, whether they believe in him or not. Because they live in God's world, whether they believe in him or not. And that's the thing that we have to understand, that we are all created in the image of God. God has blessed us with the ability to reason, to think, to love. But true understanding, wisdom, knowledge, can only come through Jesus Christ. That's it. And again, those are not my words, God says. So how does this compare to those who do not know Christ? Jesus addresses it in the latter part of the text that was read. The house that is built on the sand. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. We have to stand firm on the foundation that those who do not know Jesus, eventually their foundation will crumble. Either in this life or in eternity. Do we believe that? Can we say that with confidence? It's, uh, some of you guys here have heard my testimony, heard my story. Um, I've done some really bad things in my life. Some really bad things. And when I read this teaching of Jesus is here, I've been on both sides of this. I've had my house built on the sand. And now I've built my house on the rock because of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you from experience, and because it's in God's word, that when my foundation crumbled, the fall was great. But now the foundation is Jesus Christ, the rock. Romans 5, 8 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have all been enemies of God. 
Now, there may be some who listen to this later on on, on YouTube, and, and they do not know Christ, and, and you may say that there's not enough evidence. There's science disputes that God exists, and there's just the problem of suffering, the problem of evil. And I've been there. Now, I can say that there are good Christian theologians and philosophers who have gone at great lengths to study these issues and to have answers to these questions if you seek it out. But I'm going to tell you, based on God's word, that's not your problem. Your problem is not a lack of evidence. Your problem is not that there's no answer to the problem of suffering. That's not your problem. Your problem is sin. Your problem is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. From the beginning of Genesis to the end in Revelation, this problem is the same. Sin. Sin separates us from God. I have the problem. Everybody here has the problem. But God, in his infinite mercy, came down in human flesh. He walked a mile in our shoes. No one can accuse God to say, you don't know how this feels. Because Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He hungered. He thirsted. He was tortured. And he bore the undiluted wrath of God on the cross for sinners like us. Full bore. No dilution. And he knew no sin. Why would God do that? That's the marvelous thing about mercy and grace. We cannot fathom that. We cannot understand that. But, again, I say as I've said this whole time, we can stand on that foundation because God says. Because the holy creator of the universe says. So when I go out tomorrow and I witness to somebody and they ask me all these questions and maybe I have answers for them, maybe I don't. But the one thing that I can stand on, the one thing that I know will not crumble under my feet, even if I make a mistake, is what God says. Our foundation is upon a rock. Our foundation is sturdy and will not break. Those who do not know Christ, your foundation is on sand and it will crumble. It will shift. Because as we've seen in society from 50 years ago till now, look how much has changed. What used to be abhorrible is now accepted and celebrated. What changed? God didn't change. God's ways didn't change. People changed. So if you don't have a firm foundation, how can you know what is true? How can you know what is real? How can you know how to react? How can you know anything at all? And the answer is, you can't. Not for certain. Because you're always having to worry about if where you're standing is going to crumble under your feet and you're going to fall down. But the rock that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died for us and is the only way to salvation through God, that is the firm rock. That is the rock that does not shift. So I urge anybody who does not know Christ, you say maybe there's not enough evidence. That's not true. But read God's word because God's word has power. God's word is unchangeable. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power unto salvation. It's not me standing up here proclaiming it. The gospel is the power. The God's word is the power. But he uses us as messengers. And I pray that each of us stand firm on the foundation that God has laid for us. Be confident in whatever situation you find yourself in that God has spoken that Jesus is Lord, and that he's the only one we bow the knee to. There may be a point where I'm walking down the street and I get hit by a car, or I get cancer, or I get shot, or I have an accident at work. But God's promise in his word is that if I know Jesus Christ, that it's not the end.
If I know Jesus Christ, that my last breath here is my first breath into eternity, face to face with him. That's a foundation that gives me boldness to stand here and say that I will not bow the knee to anybody else but Jesus. No matter what the outcome, no matter if it costs me my life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your mercy beyond measure, your grace that is unfathomable, and most of all, for your saving grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to leave here firm on the foundation that you've laid before us in Jesus Christ and to show everyone that we meet the glory of the God that we serve. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.